Awesome. Well, it's great to, to be here tonight. Um, like Josiah mentioned, my name's Julian from a company called um, Astronomer, and I'm joined by uh, Christine, one of our rock star engineers here. So, uh, you know, as we're, as we're getting started, out of curiosity, how many folks are familiar with the open source data platform tool called Apache Airflow? Oh, wow. A lot of the room. That's awesome. That, uh, that shortens this a little bit. Um, so if you're not familiar, Airflow is this open source tool in the Apache Software Foundation to help people programmatically write, schedule, and run data workflows. I heard a lot of questions around like data ingestion and ETL. This is exactly the type of thing that Airflow is built to do, especially at scale. So um, I definitely recommend figure, uh, looking into it um, if you're interested. It is actually the most popular data kind of workflow tool there is with over 30 million downloads a month. It's used in like 100,000 companies out there. Um, and it, you know, it offers a, 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 like hundreds of features it's not worth getting into, but at, at its core, you, know, you can write pipelines in pure Python code with simple airflow abstractions. It's very highly extensible, which is super important for data workflows where you're oftentimes working with like bioinformatics data and you need some special functionality built out for that. Um, it's very, very scalable. It's used at you know, literally the Fortune 1 company down to five-person startups. Um, and it's got this very large, you know, vibrant open source community. Actually, a couple weeks ago, we just passed Kubernetes itself in terms of how many contributors there are to the project. Um, which I view as a very nice leading indicator to where the project is going. So, you know, super successful today. I think it'll continue growing. Um, and you know, I mentioned it's it's used to write and run data workflows, data pipelines. But like, what does that actually mean? What can you do with a data workflow? It's basically any job that you want to run on some schedule, whether that's hourly, daily, weekly. Um, and you know, across our, our customer base in the broader community, we see a bunch of different use cases, whether that's taking data, transforming it, and loading it into a database so that you can go show it you know, to your customers in the case of someone like Ramp, um, whether they're critical operational processes. We have a ton of folks that use Airflow to file regulatory reports based on data that they get throughout the week or the month. Um, analytics and reporting, of course, I'd say the most traditional uh, data use case there is. And we're also starting to see, you know, over the last couple of years, a bunch of cases, use cases come up around ML ops. You know, if you're already using this Python based tool for your broader data workflows, if you really squint, ML ops is really just data engineering. And so um, a lot of folks will use it for that. And now more and more Gen AI, where you're taking unstructured data or even structured data and feeding it into an AI application. Um, so basically, any process with data. And you know, Airflow is super easy to use. If you're familiar with Python, you can get started in less than five minutes. Um, on the left is a screenshot of the Airflow UI showing the visualization of the pipeline. And you can see a run history and you know, drill into details. And on the right-hand side is the actual Python file that populates this UI. Um, so as you can see, fairly simple to work with. It looks very similar to you know, regular Python code with the exception of a couple decorators that Airflow gives you. Um, Airflow obviously can do a lot more than this, but this is just an illustration of um, how, it, how it works. And so, you know, us at Astronomer, why, why do we care about Airflow? Um, we have actually taken Airflow, the, the open source project, um, and it's a distributed system. It can be hard to run, especially at very large scale, if you have a bunch of teams working with Airflow. Um, so in the same way like Confluent has taken Kafka or, or uh, Databricks has taken Spark and turned it into a platform that folks can go run, we've done the same thing with Airflow. Um, we're very fortunate to work with a you know, very broad customer base, like I mentioned Fortune 1 all the way down to five-person startups. Um, we uh, are at about actually 270 folks now. We raised our Series C a couple years ago. Um, and we're always on the lookout for talent, so if any of this is interesting to you, definitely come up to us afterwards. We'd love to, to talk. Um, but you know, as part of running Airflow on behalf of our customers, we contribute a ton back to the community. We think that's super important and really our number one mission at Astronomer. At this point, we've written actually over 60% of the code. We have 19 of the top 25 committers on staff here at Astronomer. We have entire engineering teams dedicated exclusively to the open source project, which is a ton of fun to work with them. And we also have a huge uh, academy and education initiative where we've actually you know, certified and educated over 30,000 um, students and professionals on, on Airflow. 
And you know, if you look inside like the context of a, a single customer or a single user of Airflow, um, you start with one pipeline, then you write a couple pipelines, and eventually you end with this whole mess of pipelines um, that all you know, interact with each other. They're owned by different teams. They're working with different data. They run on different schedules. And you know, at, at the scale that we operate, we have you know, billions of tasks that are running on our platform. And of course, it's data. Sometimes these pipelines fail. And for us, this is actually you know, a very big issue. So you're know, just taking a snapshot of one of our platforms. In a single month, we ran 18 million DAGs and 100 million tasks. And of those, 1.5% of them failed. Um, on average, from the last failed run to the most, uh, or like the next successful run, it took like a little over an hour, hour and a half. And so that's, you know, if you do the math on how many users are on our platform, that's like 26 hours a month um, just debugging failed pipelines, which obviously is not fun for anyone. It's not fun for us because our users are frustrated. It's not fun for the user because instead of building fun new use cases, they have to go spend all their time maintaining existing things. Um, and when something fails, you know, there's, there's always a set of, you know, kind of troubleshooting steps that, that you work through, right? First, you have to figure out what failed, right? You get an alert that says the pipeline failed. You have to figure out when it failed, right? Was this yesterday? Was it a week ago? Was it an hour ago? Then you have to figure out why it failed, which is always the, the most fun question because it can sometimes be obscure. Um, and most importantly, you have to understand the impact of the failure, right? If it's some pipeline that's off to the side, you can come back to it later. If it's something that's filing your regulatory reports in an hour, that's a lot more time critical, and you need to go look at that immediately. Um, and also, did anything else fail, right? Like, if your Snowflake credentials expired, you're going to see a ton of failures, and you have to go fix a ton of things at once. Um, and so this, again, is a problem that we care a lot about solving here at Astronomer because all of our customers run into this. And so we decided to build um, a product that we're calling Astro Observe that takes a bunch of the telemetry information that we have and makes it super easy to answer these questions. So I'll hand it off to Christine to tell you more about that. Awesome. Thanks, Julian. Um, but yeah, as Julian mentioned, we've built this data observability platform called Astro Observe, which gives you a comprehensive view of the health of your data, but also this overall state of your data ecosystem. So it ensures you know, your data quality and also trust and reliability in your data. And this is all built on a notion of data products, which we define as a collection of data assets. And this could be a specific table, it could be a DAG or a specific task that all tie are tied to a specific business outcome. And this could be you know, a customer dashboard, um, billing, or um, as Julian mentioned previously, like it could be a regulatory report. Um, and so with that, you can bundle all those together and get a central view of everything that's happened across your entire data product and also everything that's happening upstream. Um, sometimes you might want some guarantees around data freshness or data timeliness. And so you're also able to create an SLA and set up alerts on those SLAs so that if there ever is an SLA breach, you're notified immediately. And then we provide you all of the context around kind of what's happening and why. Um, a lot of so this is like a high level overview of what's powering this platform. As you can see, ClickHouse plays a really big role in that. Um, so a little bit about what's happening here. We get a lot, a huge volume of data um, from Airflow deployments as these run events. Um, these could be DAG or task run events, um, all of which we feed into Kafka. Um, and on top of that, we also kind of monitor other areas of our broader Astro platform. This could be deployment configuration changes or code changes. And all of these we process as events and save into ClickHouse. So diving a little bit deeper, um, each of these event types gets saved into its own events table. Um, and all of these share a collection of common fields. You can see kind of in this example here, we have run events, um, but they all across all these events share an organization ID. Um, they also have, they're tied to a specific asset um, and also a run ID, um, but they also have their own very event specific fields. So in a run event, you can have a specific type. It could be a DAG or a task. Um, the state, whether it's 
was successful or a failure, and then also it could be like how long did the task run for. Here is a sample query that we would run. Um, this is pulling in all of the events for a very specific organization and within a specific time period. Um, where we're just joining all the events based on their common fields, and then all of the event-specific fields we're kind of consolidating into a new column. So while using ClickHouse, we kind of found that there are four main benefits. Um, one of the big things was scalability. Um, with the type of data that we were getting, we found that it was really easy to scale by adding new tables rather than having to update our existing schemas. Um, another thing, too, is with uh, data maintenance. One, we're able to set specific TTLs on each of the tables, so that helps automate data cleanup. Um, there's also data deduplication. We found that they offer merge tree table engines that does that deletes duplicate records um, under the hood, which is pretty neat. Um, and the final thing is the materialized views. Um, so. We all know that running like aggregations or summarization queries can be really expensive, um, especially on read time. And materialized views have been extremely helpful in allowing us to pre-compute all of those on insertion time instead of at read time, which allows for us to query a lot faster. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, open to any questions that anyone might have. Thanks. Kafka before you hit ClickHouse. Why do you go to ClickHouse? I mean, why do you go to Kafka before ClickHouse? Yeah, it's it's just a scale thing. Um, if like ingestion to ClickHouse, for example, everybody. So we actually have um, a bunch of Go microservices in between Kafka and ClickHouse that run like some business logic on taking the various events that we see and turning them into something more meaningful, whether that's like augmenting it with data about the organization or dropping certain events or doing other things. Um, it's really just a, a scale thing. We actually started, our first architecture was an ingestion API that wrote directly to Postgres, um, and that just didn't scale very well. So I think I'd say at, you know, out of an abundance of caution, um, we put Kafka in front of it. And that also lets us retry events, which is super nice. Like if we try to process something and something's down, we just put it back in the queue. Um, cause sending events from Airflow to our backend um, should not be a blocking task. Like it should be additional metadata, especially if it's like a regulatory report that one of our customers is trying to send. So we want to immediately acknowledge it, let the pipeline continue running, and then do our, our processing you know, closer to offline. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh... I think you just answered my question. You mentioned that the first version was on Postgres, essentially. Yeah, first version was um, on RDS. Uh, we had like provisioned, uh, we had tried to provision like a database per customer to keep things isolated and keep things scaling well. Um, at a certain point, it just didn't scale well, especially with like the more analytical queries that we would run if you're looking for like a series of events or want to filter down to a time range. We also had to be very careful about what made it to Postgres um, because it had such a big impact on performance. With ClickHouse, I mean, one of the nice things is like you can just dump as much data in there as you want to, and it'll you know stay there. You either use it or every table that we set up, we put a time to live on it. Um, so worst case, like if we don't use the information, it's like gone in 90 days, um, and that keeps storage costs pretty manageable. Quick question, in terms of Astro Observe, the new product, is that gonna break off and fall into like the data observability category, like the Monte Carlos, Excel data, the sodas, the, 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 that type of um, anomaly detection and uh, anomalo and that kind of thing? Is that its focus or is the scope only where um, Astronomer has deployed? Yeah, it's, it, it's a great question. Um, so Observe is a pretty new product for us. We announced it about a month and a half ago. Um, we're pretty laser focused on Airflow reliability and like the reliability of the data that you deliver through Airflow. Um, what we've found though in, you know, in conversations with 
some of our early customers is that there's definitely an appetite um, to do more with it. I think one of the nice things is Airflow is already hooked into basically every data source within an organization. So if you do want to go like instrument data quality checks, as an example, you can do that at the pipeline level, emit an event to our back end, and then we give you this like common unified experience. Um, one of the things that we, you know, we kind of only highlighted a screenshot of um, what we're calling this timeline view of like, hey, you just violated an SLA, right? Your data is more than 24 hours old. Here's everything that happened that might be interesting to help you figure it out as quickly as possible. Um, this isn't the only thing we've built. We've also built like a metrics backend where you can emit data volume metrics, data quality metrics, and we'll go help you correlate those things. I think like in the longer term, it's tough to say on our product strategy, but what I do know is like, having all of this data in one place is very, very good because the types of questions you can then answer get really interesting. I have a question. So what did you, um, what did you two guys um, to choose like Clubhouse? Because there's a lot of like other open source solution like um, Iceberg, you know, like uh, Hivebase. And then also like Airflow, as I know, like they have pretty good integration itself with Iceberg and the TTL, all that stuff, like travel back in time, Iceberg support pretty well as well. Uh, what did you guys to use like Clubhouse? And do you guys use uh, Clubhouse on premises or on, on the cloud? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a good question. the The full history is actually um, about a year ago now. At one of these events, I was talking to Ryan um, from Ramp, hey. and he mentioned that they had just spun up ClickHouse, um, and it you know we were looking for something that solved those same types of problems. And I, I would rather go with you know someone I know and trust as opposed to doing an evaluation of like sixty different tools. Because to your point, like. If that's the functionality, if that's all the functionality we want, like there's a couple of things out there that do it. Um, you know, ClickHouse has been very, very good to work with. We're on their cloud product, which makes managing it super easy. Like we literally don't have to think about it. I don't think we. It's been down ever. It's never caused us any issues. Um, we looked at you know a, a couple of different ways of running analytical databases, but ultimately like between the familiarity with ClickHouse, how receptive the team was, it felt like you know it it would work well, and it it has. So kudos to the product. 